Thank you. We have one more uh, lecture today, and I'm sorry that they were all collapsed today, and you have to bear with me. <laughs> so this our last one, it will be on youth citizenship and social change. And uh, when we spoke this morning, we spoke about these youth subcultures uh, of created by young people in Waitwood in this state of suspension between uh, uh, being uh, young and getting into adult responsibilities um, that they create to try and uh, manage their lives, so to speak. And in those spaces, they create also some kind of solidarity or some kind of uh, group consciousness, and some of them kind of organize themselves into something uh, more in terms of social engagement and participation in society. But I think this lecture is also a good segue to Idriso's uh, presentation on citizenship and participation. When he looked at in Cameroon, uh, young people's engagement in uh, uh, civil society organizations and discussions about whether that engagement was a political engagement or just a citizenship engagement. So in this lecture, we will look at youth participation and citizenship and try to deal with some of those concepts of citizenship, of participation, um, the notion of the political, how young people understand the political, but also um, look at uh, participation in the context of everyday life actions and also participation in terms of uh, public uh, larger engagements like street protests, uprisings, revolts, and even revolutions. But uh, first, I think uh, in order to create the context for this participation, I think it might be a bit repetitive, but I think it's important to highlight young people's sense of marginalization and exclude exclusion from the socioeconomic, but also the political arenas. In, um, from the research I, de I developed in Mozambique, South Africa, Senegal, and Tunisia, it was unanimous amongst the, the young people I've, uh, I've been in touch with that they are disenchanted with politics and politicians. They see the role of the state and the role of the political parties as being something that is done not for public good, but for uh, individual and uh, uh, for individual enhancement, enrich, uh, uh, enrichment, but also for uh, creating some kind of uh, clientelist, or clientelist as the, uh, uh, in French, uh, or patrimonial politics. Um, that do not serve uh, the entire society, but a few groups of small uh, elites. Uh, people feel that, or young people feel that they are marginalized and excluded from uh, sharing uh, the, the little wealth that the state might uh, have through opportunities that are given to citizens in general. So, um, and they understand very well the causes of this structural position, and they are conscious of the marginal position and the way in which politicians and also some of their elders portray them as young people who are uh, lazy, not hard workers, and want an easy life, et cetera, et cetera. But they say that this is all part of a discourse of alienating them uh, 
from, uh, from mainstream uh, political uh, uh, engagement. Because in a way, they see that people get into politics to be able to share some of the resources that the, the country has. So they say, you know, people get into politics not because of the majority uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, young people mentioned that some of the politicians get into politics not because they want to serve the community, but because they have to have a chance to uh, uh, put their hands into some of those resources. Because uh, the, the patterns of accumulation in, the, in many African societies go through political uh, allegiances, political parties, uh, political power. Uh, if you are a politician, the, 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 the avenues for your uh, wealth, the avenues for your power are open. And so there are no alternative routes, or there are very few, or they are very difficult. So politics is a route for uh, also self-promotion, self-development, uh, 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 etc. And so young people feel really uh, very uh, um, disenchanted with the way uh, the political system in their countries operate. And uh, they look at um, uh, the kind of governance structures that exist as being very weak and lacking eff effective policies. For example, they talked about ad hoc policies that do not effectively resolve the situation. In a way, they kind of uh, pay lip service to the needs of the youth. They would say, okay, let's create a particular structure for, for supporting youth, but that structure is ill-equipped, uh, the leadership of that structure is not strong enough, it has no power or no resources to really do effectively the job that needs to be done to promote uh, 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 well-being of the younger generation. They gave me examples of, uh, for example, uh, youth uh, entrepreneurship schemes, uh, Fonds National de Promotion de la Jeunesse uh, here in Senegal that you know, was created but it didn't really give strong results. In Tunisia, they have the, uh, this bank for youth entrepreneurship which was the BTS, Banque Tunisienne de Solidarité, that was there to give support to young people, but in the end, nothing happened. It was all political machinations. Only those who attended party meetings would have the, the resources, etc. And the thing is that uh, they saw the political as having its tentacles everywhere. So if you were not in the good books of certain politicians, you had no chance. Even if you were a hard worker somewhere, etc., you have to go. So all the routes for making it, for being su successful, are often controlled by this overpowering political system that controls everything. You, have, you cannot have access to bank loans if you don't know a politician or someone who's going to facilitate. It's not a question of merit, often that counts, but it's the connections and et cetera. <laughs> Young Mozambicans, they say, uh, uh, we need to have a party uh, membership card that it's called the Vermelho. Vermelho in Portuguese is the red because the party card is a red card. And they said to me, that card it's not just a political card, it's a credit card. It functions as a credit card. Because when you have that, you go for a, a, a job interview, et cetera, and you say, you know, I'm a member. You just put your cards, you know, in the pocket just so that the person interview you. And if you have that card, they know that you are well connected. And so they will treat you differently. If you don't, et cetera. And uh, Tunisians also spoke of the same thing 
Senegalese uh, 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 youths that I spoke to, the same story, and the stories that I read in writings about other uh, uh, social um, contexts around the continent that other colleagues have looked at. Um, and also from Idrisu's um, uh, presentation just now, we could uh, uh, read some of that. <laughs> And so this idea of the corruption in terms of allocation of resources and uh, uh, nepotism, giving preferences to people who are from uh, our own village or our own clans or our own uh, ethnic group or our own family, um, favoring people we know, the son or daughter of a friend, etc., creating all these uh, mechanisms to uh, favor some people over other and creating this kind of elite groups is uh, something that young people really despise and uh, feel strongly about. For example, in South Africa, there were numerous stories about black empowerment strategies in which they felt that only a few of the black South African had a right to become uh, a part or to be supported by this black empowerment strategy. The majority only heard about it and when they applied with projects, and if they were not known in the party structures, if they were not part of the ANC we Youth League, if they didn't know people well connected here and there, they had no chance to, uh, to evolve. Of course, all these things are said in the plural, are said in the, in the general rule, but that's how people feel. We might find an example here and there that one or other young man succeeded without those connections, but it's rare. Here we're looking more at what is the, the rule rather than the exception. And in general, there is the sense, the sentiment of neglect, there is the sentiment of marginalization, of exclusion, and a sense that these patrimonial types of politics are determining who has access to what, in what way, etc. So um, this aspect of being, of feeling of marginalization, etc., has a lot to do with the way young people engage themselves with the society they live in. And uh, as Idriso mentioned, uh, the, there is a tendency for young people to choose associ associative uh, structures rather than political parties, precisely because of that. Th some of those who join political parties, they join them because they feel that it will give them certain advantages, n but not because they believe in the ideologies behind that or they believe in the principles that are guiding those, those institutions, but because they can get certain advantages. It's the, the, the old say, if you can't beat them, join them. And some prefer to do that. While others stay away because they, they, they see that they won't have a chance. But if we talk about this, it's important also to look at what we understand by citizenship to start with. And then we will move into participation, and then we will move into politics. Um, citizenship has been presented, and uh, you, have a, you had a chance to read in the lecture, so I will not go into detail here. But citizenship has been also uh, 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 discussed uh, uh, as two conceptions of citizenship conflated in one. One is the notion of state citizenship, in which is the membership to a particular nation or particular community. You are a citizen of Uganda, you are a citizen of Burkina Faso, or you are a citizen of Egypt. So it's that sense of citizenship. And when you are a citizen, there are certain rights that you have by being a citizen, etc. There are also certain obligations, etc. And there is also the concept of citizenship as being a sense of participation, participatory citizenship when citizenship means engagement in the issues that are of interest to that community to which you belong. Citizenship as an active and conscious act of being engaged with your society, 
not being aloof or being apathetic to everyday life uh, 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 actions and common interests in that community. You are part of it, you engage with it, you contribute to it, you, you learn from it, you, you teach, you, you, you are in symbiosis with the, the community to which you belong. And so these two uh, ideas, being a citizen of a nation state and being an active participant from that community you belong, that's what con constitutes this concept of citizenship. But citizenship has been all often, uh, to get to this point, there has been a lot of exchanges between scholars looking at this. I'll mention just briefly, the citizenship has been seen from early on by scholars like Marshall, who wrote in 1949 uh, his book on citizenship. And Marshall uh, saw citizenship as an acquisition of rights. And he, what he said really was that rights are acquired gradually. And your citizen, your sense of being a citizen is strengthened with the acquisition of rights. And that there is a sequential path to the acquisition of rights. You start with acquiring civil rights as a member of that society, political rights, and then social rights. Uh, but the Marshall's view has been criticized by various uh, scholars, many in Europe. But I would, and I would just wanted to, to highlight two critiques that come out of the continent. One is the critique made by Tandikam Kandawira, who was one of the uh, executive secretaries of Kodersia for many years. Tandika is from Malawi. Uh, um, He's a very well-known African scholar. And Tandika uh, said, uh, uh, criticized Marshall's idea of, uh, of uh, basing citizenship on rights and the sequential and the uh, gradual acquisition of rights by saying that societies that come at the later stage, they might conflate all that stages. We don't need to follow the path of Europe in the way they evolved, but we could look at uh, African societies conflating civil, political, and social rights at one, because societies do not evolve in a predetermined, sequential, uh, linear way. They have uh, uh, ups and downs, uh, they have detours, they have advances, and, uh, and also the advances that we have seen in the modern world that have created different patterns. And he thinks that in Africa, we have these, all these rights conflated. We don't have to wait 10 years to then acquire political rights and then another set of decades to acquire social rights, et cetera. But the people's expectations and the ability to have all these rights uh, conflated uh, is, uh, is uh, to be looked at in the context of, uh, of our own societies. Mahmoud Mamdani also, he wrote, he wrote a seminal book called Citizen and Subject in which he discusses the idea of citizenship. I will not go into detail here, but I just wanted to highlight uh, uh, some of the points he made in a different paper that I, I published for, uh, when I was with the Open University. He came to give a, a lecture there and we published it as a working paper in which Mamdani says, you know, the critical issue in Africa is not just about what rights, but it's also about who has the right to rights and who has the right to determine uh, 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 who has access to rights, so to speak. I don't have the quote here. Uh, oh, in fact, I do, but I have to look for it. But you have in the lecture um, the quote from Mamdani, which really, in a way, expresses this uh, very, uh, this idea very, very clearly. I think I found it, and so I can read it to you. Uh, and what does Mamdani says? He says, um, it's not which rights, but whose rights? Who has the right to rights? Who has the right to be a citizen? And this idea of being a citizen and having the right is very central because I'm sure you will remember uh, debates about 
uh, citizenship, about uh, belonging, about ethnicity, that were very uh, uh, present in the continent a few years ago, and there were lots of debates in academia. Remember when Kenneth Kaunda, after being president of Zambia for many years, then was decided that he was no longer a Zambian. He had no right to Zambian citizenship. And, uh, and there were other cases, I think in Cote d'Ivoire, during the, 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 the war there, they were about Bédier, and uh, I can't remember if it was uh, with Bagbo or, avant or before, but there were these debates on who is a true Ivorian, those who immigrate, when did they immigrate, the father and the mother. So these political decisions about citizenship, belonging, and also autochtony, who belongs to what? The? Alassal Wata. In terms of participation, it is, uh, and before I get to that, probably I would have to say that all this critique to Marshall's uh, focus on rights, just as a kind of a, the rights are there as if they were kind of given to you like this. Uh, that critique has created a shift and uh, around the 60s and later, we see a shift from a rights-based discourse into an obligations-based discourse. And say, okay, rights are important, but we don't need just to have rights. A citizen also has obligations in relation to the state. And so there was this view that a true citizen or citizenship had this dual uh, notion of rights and obligations. On the one hand, that is the, the part that the state has to provide to the citizen, but that is also what the citizen has to provide to the state, his obligations, be an active participant in the life of society, do his part or her part of the bargain in what it means to be a good uh, citizen. So um, in terms of political participation, that kind of links to the issue of obligations of citizens. Political participation has often been seen as participation in formal politics. But uh, many uh, uh, authors have uh, criticize that view as being very limiting. And especially the feminist movement uh, was very instrumental in opening up the political space uh, and other movements as, as well. Um, and looking at, the po uh, at politics as more broad than just uh, the strictly political party participation or electoral politics. Uh, multi-party systems and elections, etc., And to look at uh, political participation that included both individual and collective actions that were concerned with contributing to shape the community or society in which we live. So political participation being this broad understood, broadly understood uh, more uh, kind of uh, theoretically. But in real life, uh, people still associate politics to those at the top, the leaders, those who are running the country, the, the government, the president, the ministers, the heads of the parties, the member of the parliament, those who are the decision makers, those who have the power to decide uh, uh, the destinies of, uh, of the country. Uh, and uh, what they see, and going back to their sense of marginalization, what they see is a political system that is not serving their interest, a political system from which they want to run away and not be part of. Either if they want to be part of is, as we said, to instrumentalize uh, uh, the, the, the fact that they there, they can use it for their own gain, but the majority really stay outside because they don't see themselves as part of that. And also, it, one has to say, it's not easy to get into it 
because it's also anything that creates benefits and has a, a, a creates a kind of access uh, has a kind of a club membership and that is a selection that is some kind of gatekeeping on who is allowed in etc cetera, etc cetera. and although it might be uh, uh, might give the impression of being open to everyone, there is always uh, some kind of, uh, of uh, interests and gatekeeping and how you might be a member of the party but not have the same benefits as other members have, etc. There is always some kind of uh, uh, selection and uh, which line you tow, who you are associated with, etc., etc and your behavior, etc. So what I've seen in these countries is that most young people reject politics. And by rejecting politics, they reject, uh, they don't reject the political, but they reject politics as they know. And in a sense, this kind of party politics, the way they play, they say politics are dirty games. People pretend to be things that they are not. People pretend that they will do things. They lie to us at electoral campaigns, and then when they get into power, they forget about us. And so they don't trust politicians. They think politicians are working for their own good. For example, here, people were saying uh, President Watt, when he tried to change the Constitution and created that uh, kind of 25% margin for the second round, uh, for election on the second round to facilitate his election, and then created the, the post of vice president. He was doing that to facilitate, presumably, uh, um, the election of his own son, Karim Wad, as vice president. And the post of vice president, the way it was designed was that the vice president automatically assumes power if the president resigns or if something happens to the president. So people took it as a move that the old man would say, well, I'm old, I'll pass the torch to my son, then I will kind of uh, resign and my son automatically gives. And that's what created the uproar that took the Yanamar and other civil society movements out to the streets and they blocked that constitutional amendment. But it's that kind of uh, situations. For example, they talk about, you see that monument at the Mamel. There, when I was here, the, 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 there was a, the young people were criticizing the monument because they say, you know, we're dying. Uh, well, no, we're not dying, but we, we don't have jobs. We have uh, lack of resources, etc. And we spend millions doing that monument. And they said that's because the politicians are getting a cut on those contracts. There is corruption involved. Even the big highways, the Corniche, et cetera, they said there's a lot of money that has been put there. They're doing all these big uh, uh, auto routes, these big uh, highways. And what about fixing the electricity? And they were talking about the boat that brought, I think, uh, oil for the, the, the electrical power station here and stayed for months because there were disputes between the government and uh, some other uh, um, company that was supposed to, to deal with the electri electri electricity problems in Dakar and nothing was done. And in fact, the Yanamar movement started as a form of reivindication about the power cuts and lack of it electricity in Dakar because that power station could not um, accommodate the growth of the population and the electricity needs in the, in, the, in the city. So this to give you an example of the concrete things that young people were mentioning about the government not responding to their interests. And again, in Mozambique, young people mention uh, that the government has this policy of opening up all the minerals. There are lots of minerals, coal and gas in, in Mozambique they have been discovering. 
The government are taking cuts on um, contracts with multinationals, etc. But they are not putting any policies that say that mineral extraction in Mozambique has also to do with some kind of transformation and develop industries that will create jobs. And I think in the, the lecture, I mentioned the uh, Mozambican economist who, who has a critique of the government's policies as not enlarging the social base in which that, uh, uh, that wealth can be shared with the local communities. But what it does is to enrich the elites because they can take uh, cuts in those contracts. They can be, uh, have joint ventures with uh, uh, ex uh, foreign companies, etc. So in a way is that, is that the politic is controlling all those uh, uh, arenas of power. It's overpowering, it's all encompassing. Uh, they control everything. And so it is in, the, in this situation of being trapped that you know, they cannot make ends meet. And some of them said, you know, when you t your stomach is full, when you are somehow a little content with your life, certain things you let them go. But if they're doing all these abuses, all this corruption, and in the end you starving and you struggling to make each day, and you, make, you see this gap between those who have and those who don't widening every day, and then there comes the World Bank and says, Mozambique is a success story and there is economic growth, then something is wrong. Then we cannot tolerate uh, that. And there is a say in Guinea-Bissau, they say that we know that the, the, the bosses, the, the powerful, they eat more because they are the big ones. But when they eat with their uh, hand closed, nothing trickles down to those who are under. So if they at least would open their hands, the rice would fall and it would quiet those down here. And so these are popular sayings in a way that reflect the sense of uh, marginalization, of uh, abandonment that people feel. And that's why people in a way react to this. And for many years, there was the sense that youth in Africa, they were apathetic, they were apolitical, they didn't care about um, the uh, 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 participa participating and engaging in their societies. Um, but that perception, perception, I think, has been changing, especially in the last uh, a few years when we see uh, greater engagement of young people uh, uh, outside their everyday life actions. And here I would like to look at two ways of looking at youth participation and, uh, and also of looking at issues of social change. The one is that we look at youth participation often and social change as being something that has to happen in the grand scale of things. You know, if there is a revolution, for example, when we look at